good evening to the honorable speakers of today's webinar dr hendrickson mr dickers honorable moderator dr chattopadhyay president of our association mr arnav jha coordinator seminar committee mr shobhit dotto and all our participants we are going to start today's webinar on leather fact within a few minutes this event is an initiative of our seminar committee of indian leather technology association the committee has planned to organize series of such programs on leather fact on regular intervals after the deliberation is over the speaker will reply to the queries of the participants all participants are requested to send their question or raise your hand via chat so that he can be called to ask his questions during question answer session till then the participants are requested to keep themselves in mute mode and also keep your video in off mode the session will continue for approximately 1 hour we request all participants to give a patient hearing and help us to complete the event effectively you can also participate in this event through facebook live on ilt hr now to start with i request mr arnav jha to deliver welcome address uh, hello good evening honorable dr utar hendrickson manager research and development and geologist at nera honorable mr egbert dickers global director sustainability at speed and zoom chair ratan rajadeli dr budhadev chatterbadai ex principal of gcelt and mckb institute of engineering mr sushant mollik general secretary ilta mr shubhir dotto coordinator of the seminar committee members colleagues students and all participants i on behalf of the executive committee of iit welcome you all to join the second episode of webinar on leather facts for information to public and stakeholders including the end of advantage to the industry in this episode two lectures will be delivered namely leather biodegradability by dr utar hendrickson and leather and circular economy by mr ekbar dickers so far our knowledge goes that the natural leather is biodegradable because it is eventually made of collagen cells from the outer covering of animal that have been treated say by tanning or to slow down or to stop at the decay process but will eventually decompose if it is not cared for or intentionally made to rot or decompose decomposition of natural leather depends on kind of environmental elements it is exposed to such as uv rays oxygen level microbial environment etc now most of the natural leather is mineral or chemical than making it to <clears throat> last longer with prolonged biodegradability however from the stage of carcass recovery to ultimate decomposition documents on sustainable practice is under process by dr k j siram director clri and discussion at all relevant level and finally approved in compliance to the iotc as executive body the circular economy in leather is another very important issue in recent years the way we produce and use the products is and will be shifting from the linear model to the circular one important and influential body like european commission realized that it's only by achieving this <clears throat> change the target for keeping global warming at a manageable level is possible unfortunately it is not realized that already one sector that our leather is a perfect option for circular economy model at this stage we all in the global leather fraternity should start a new leather and circular economy section we should provide the platform for tanners leather chemical makers and allied companies finished product manufacturer to share their opinion and experiences on this subject now before i conclude 
I would like to mention that Professor Dr. Buddhadev Chattopadhyay, ex-principal ECLT and ex-principal MCK of Engineering College, has consented to moderate the total program, and we are grateful to him. With this, I once again welcome you all. Thank you. I request now. Thank you, Mr. Ja. Now I request Mr. Subir Dotto, the coordinator seminar committee, to introduce the honorable speakers and the moderator before their deliberation starts. Mr. Dotto, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Malik. Thank you, Mr. Jha. And good day to all the participants to today's webinar. And a warm welcome to our esteemed speakers. For our second in series webinar on leather facts, our topics today is on leather and circular economy and leather biodegradability, where we have two well-known personalities who will give their, give their views on the subject. Our first speaker is Mr. Egbert Dickers, who is Global Director Sustainability at Smith & Zoom and Chair of Leather Naturally. Egbert has been working in the leather industry at Smith & Zoom since 1992. He started in Smith & Zoom in sales of patent specialty chemicals and has had various management positions since then. In his current role, Egbert is making use of his wide industry experience and is leading Smith & Zoom in creating a socially and environmentally sustainable leather value chain. Egbert was one of the founders of the Kennedy of the Future Awareness Tool. At the Responsible Leather Roundtable, he is involved in the International Working Group for the Responsible Leather Assessment Tool at Development. At, at Leather Naturally, he is involved as a member of the Management Board, acting as Chair. So now, uh, Mr. Egbert Dickers, over to you for your deliberations. Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, I think you can uh, you can see my screen now, is it? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Um, now, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Mr. Subir, and uh, for the introduction as well. And um, I would really uh, like to thank you um, um, for the nice words and for the invitation. And also on behalf of Letter Naturally, I would like to welcome you in this uh, webinar. I would prefer to have been in India together with you. I have been in India many, many times. I have many friends over there and it's always good to be in India again. But uh, regretfully, uh, the current moment is not uh, the right moment for that. Um, my name is Egbert Dickers and I have been in the leather industry for almost 30 years. And uh, as uh, Mr. Subir said, that in addition to my day job as a global director of sustainability for Smith & Zone, I chair Leather Naturally. And uh, Leather Naturally is a global nonprofit organization. And um, that's a nonprofit organization with members from all over the leather value chain. And members include meat packers, hide and skin traders, um, uh, leather manufacturers, chemical companies, machinery companies, test houses and various associate members um, like, for instance, your CLI in, uh, in India. Leather naturally was set up some years ago because the industry felt the need to react to misleading information shared via the press and via the social media by organizations that use factually wrong information. And sometimes I think they do this uh, uh, deliberately to damage the image of leather. And today, Ladder Naturally is an association. It's run by a management board and is made up of volunteers from its members. So uh, <laughs> the organizers of this webinar asked me to focus my presentation towards the importance of leather in the circular economy. And to be honest, I have been a bit puzzled by this title and I've been also a bit puzzled by this invitation because of the fact that uh, today I'm talking to a group of, uh, I call it always, converted people. I don't think I need to convince any one of you that leather is a good product. So what I want to do uh, today is that I want to share you some of the slides and, and the messaging that leather naturally is, uh, is using in promoting leather, in educating and promoting leather, um, educating and promoting leather in the, uh, in the industry. Um, now, yeah, normally, as I said, Leonard Naturally is mainly talking uh, on events where brands and designers are the main audience. 
And this audience is very critical to get towards ladder for many different reasons. And it's therefore that I want to share you a bit the story uh, that we are telling to the uh, to this kind of events. And I would like to do that in a way that I hope that this is also a kind of potential inspiration for yourself uh, to make more use of the letter naturally materials, to make more use of the uh, arguments that we are using, because it's very important that we are all going to use a similar storyline to demonstrate that letter is the perfect material in a circular society. But okay, today I also want to reach out to you for support. So I'm bringing you something, but I would also like to collect something because our industry is under heavy attack. It's under heavy attack with brands looking for alternative materials instead of leather. And these brands are pushed by NGOs like PETA, but also other critical NGOs that highlight the bad circumstances in our industry. And some of their claims and some of the claims of these organizations are completely nonsense and it's not linking to any facts, but some of their claims are true and are mainly a result of our own negligence, eh, of your and my negligence for many years and often still today. And let's be honest to each other, the leather industry has been growing strongly over the last decades with almost nobody, realize, almost nobody realizing that this growth could come to a standstill. And I think that for decades, the major part of our industry has not spent any money, has not spent any money on education and promotion of leather. And still today, many companies do not yet realize what's going on in society and what this means for the future of leather. And I only want to give you two examples of the last two weeks, which was an article in uh, the European papers about Mini, eh, part of BMW, saying that they no longer want to use leather. And the same happened also with Volvo, announcing that they don't want to use leather in a couple of years time. So we have a major challenge and uh, it's uh, up to you and up to me, but especially also up to you to, uh, to make a change in that. But okay, first of all, I want to briefly share something about Leather Naturally. Leather Naturally is uh, promoting the use of globally manufactured sustainable leather and seeks to inspire and inform designers, creators and consumers about its beauty, quality and versatility. And to do that, Leather Naturally is focusing on two main things. That's education and promotion. And we are very pleased and very proud also that in the middle of last year, we launched a brand new website with all kinds of fact sheets and background information in different languages about the benefits of leather, uh, about the environment, uh, leather and the environment, uh, environment. We made informational guides about manufacturing. And the website is in itself already a result of a careful check on the internet to really understand the kind of questions that brands and consumers have in relation to leather. And it is our aim to become the global resource to get the facts and understand leather. And via our social media channels, we try to inspire our audience about leather as a sustainable material. And we have created also our online digital platform, which is called Metcha which is the oracle of leather design and culture that constantly inspires through its interviews, features and articles that report on everything from startups that are recycling leather trainers to iconic automobiles and the best vintage stores for leather jackets. And events like this, we try to share our passion for leather and make you aware of the existence of leathernaturally.org as a source of information to better understand the material and the request for your support to join us. Yeah, Leather naturally launched Metcha in, uh, in the middle of uh, 2019 as a global initiative to dialogue with the final consumer about leather. Because I think we should realize that in many cases, the, the young generations do not have a connection to leather anymore. And I will tell you more about it later. But in Metcha, we target Generation Z and millennials with the ultimate goal that leather is becoming a familiar word. It's becoming a familiar concept, a familiar topic and a familiar material. And since the launch, we have reached an audience of over 2 million people and ensured that our messaging was seen over 100 million times. And the Metcha initiative is now entering its second year after we now crowdfunded close to $1 million 
from a group of industry leaders that understand the importance of investing in a ladder image. We hope that many of you will be willing to look into the possibility to support Mesha with the financial donation as well. I would especially like to thank five Indian companies that are currently a member of Ladder Naturally. And I also would like to thank the Council for Ladder Exports who donated funds to the Mecha campaign in 2019. On the other hand, this slide with these five companies also illustrates that we, you, should question yourselves how we can get more support from the Indian ladder industry through membership and Mecha donations. Because with so many companies in India's ladder industry, five members for ladder naturally is still not, not much. And I mean, the industry in India is so big, you have a crucial role to support initiatives like Leather Naturally. For your information, membership is ranging from 250 to $2,000 for the larger companies. And in my opinion, this is a small investment for a company that understands that Leather is under attack and that we need to show leadership and unity on a global scale to educate and promote Leather. We would be pleased to welcome many of you as a new uh, member uh, after this webinar. So um, um, feel free to contact me after this webinar. Yeah, in the next few slides, I will illustrate the kind of messaging that Ladder Naturally is using when it connects to brands and designers. And mostly we do this by highlighting the unique opportunities and the unique properties of Ladder. And we do that by busting the major myths. Because why should you consider using leather in your article? Simply said, because leather is a unique material. It's a material that is made either from whole, wholly recycled or part recycled components. And that does not call on any finite resources eh, like oil, which is the basis for plastics. Leather is a material that lasts a long time, maybe even between generations, and that gets better with age. Leather is a material that is easy to maintain, can be repaired, and at the end of its life can be recycled. It's a material that is versatile, it can be used for many different end uses. And it's something that we know is responsibly made by an industry that is constantly innovating for change and improvements and is accountable through certifications and internationally recognized manufacturing protocols. I will tell you a bit more about that as well. But before we are going into the myths, uh, we would like you to realize, and I know that I'm talking to the converted, so you realize <laughs> that leather is the perfect material for a world that wants to consume less, reuse more, and recycle everything. And leather with a history of approximately 5,000 years is the oldest example of recycling because it was used already by the ancient Egyptians. Regretfully, there are various myths about leather, of which we will discuss some that leather naturally is most asked about. And most of these claims miss any connection to reality. Myth number one, billions of animals are killed to make leather. Here I would like you to realize, I would like you to realize that market research has shown that in several European countries, including the United States, approximately 60% of young generations believes that the animal is killed to make leather. Just imagine this, 60%, 60% of young people thinks that the animal is killed specifically to make leather, 60%. And just combine this with the fact that critical minds have been very successful in creating a general opinion that the meat industry is the main contributor to climate change, to deforestation and loss of biodiversity. Now I would like you to consider yourself being a teenager. Think about your child, think about your son, about your daughter. Why would you buy a leather shoe or a leather bag when you consider that what I just mentioned is true? I think it's very good sometimes to realize this because here is also, um, uh, this is also the key uh, to um, focusing on this for the future. In total, an estimated 7.3 million tons of hides are produced every year as a byproduct from the food industry. And it's good to share the facts that an increased demand for leather 
will not increase the availability of hides and skins because there is no economic incentive for a farmer to breed more animals. And in relation to this, a lower demand for leather will result in an increasing amount of landfill, which we have seen happening in recent months due to COVID-19. And as such, we believe that we all have an ethical duty to ensure that as long as humans consume dairy and meat for their protein needs, we should upcycle every hide and skin into leather instead of downcycling or wasting it. Because leather is an upcycled material with unique characteristics that fits perfectly in a modern society. And it is our mutual challenge to be able to explain this story to the brands, to the consumer, to your children, to your friends, based on facts instead of myths. And only by being able to explain the true story about leather, brands and consumers will be able to become more proud about this material and realize that leather is a modern material suitable in a, in a responsible society. And as we buy less and as we buy better, we will come to value worn, but obviously valued and cared for items rather than those that look box fresh. And at the start of the product life cycle, we also see designers learning how to create products that can be repaired, making a zip easy to replace, for example, so that a broken component does not limit to life of a product. In foodwear, we are having conversations with designers and developers who are looking at every component, every stiffer or every filler to understand if that compromises the ability of a finished product to be repaired or restored. And we are starting to see a full deconstruction of the process that starts with not just the end point in mind, but the evolution of the product on its journey. So leather lasts a long time. So it is well suited to being made into something else. And the work at Patterson and Stoop, for example, is a great example of taking loved items and turning them into something else that will not only be as equally loved, but have high design value too. It's a company that is entirely reworking old sneakers into completely new products. And I tell you, you will want these shoes. And some time ago, we saw the launch of the Revivo scheme from Vivo Barefoot. That's an initiative that will revive, worn or return shoes and sell them onto the Revivo platform. And this is a hugely exciting sector. And we might have wondered where it would go when we first saw the Patagonia worn wear trailer making its first appearance on outdoor retailer a couple of years ago. But it is one of the most creative places to be right now. And leather, due to its longevity, is the perfect, perfect partner material for these programs. There are also different ways of using waste from either leather or leather manufacturing. If you haven't seen it, check it out. And check out the work of Elvis and Cress. That's a brand that, is, that uses what they call rescued raw materials, including leather from fire hoses and offcuts from Burberry. And leatherboard, often used in inner soles, is made by grinding leather or by using leather production shavings. It's another example that leather and its byproducts can be recycled. And ultimately, leather will biodegrade anywhere from 10 to 50 years, depending on type. And this is an area where the industry is working further to balance longevity and ultimately biodegradability. And my uh, colleague, Dr. Wouter uh, Hendriksen, is telling you more about that after my presentation. The other myth is vegan leather is more sustainable. And I'll, I always get very annoyed with this term because this term vegan leather, it's a contradiction by itself. In fact, to use the name leather, in branding a material can only be done as per the internationally agreed description by ISO. And that's described as the height or the skin with its original fibrous structure, more or less intact, tend to be impenetrable, where the hair or the wool may or may not have been removed. And in various countries, to include the term leather in branding a material that is not made from leather, that's just illegal. It's an, it's an offense. But okay, we notice that brands choose to label their products vegan to attract an audience that is sensitive to use products that contain animal products. And I think the primary reason is, is that by using a term vegan is just creating extra margin. 
Better Naturally has made a labeling information sheet that can be downloaded from the website. It includes the major labeling descriptions that are currently being used for materials that are not made from leather. And we want to stress, we really want to stress that the leather industry has nothing against any other alternatives or anything against materials. In fact, I believe that many of the final leather articles variety to the brands and is creating new challenging articles. But we do feel that consumers have a right to understand what kind of materials are used in their shoe or in their bag, as mostly alternatives are made from plastic or use plastic to strengthen the material. And it's really questionable if consumers would have chosen the alternative material when they would know it's made of leather. And that's often the reason also why a brand is not mentioning the material, but giving a fancy name to a material to cover that it is made of plastic. In my opinion, responsible brands, they label their pro products correctly and transparently, telling the consumer what the article is composed of. So I would like to invite you to use the fact sheets in your communication with brands or in your company communication with companies or press that wrongly labels products and wrongly inform consumers. Another myth touches the way that leather is manufactured. And we frequently get asked by uh, why leather manufacturing is unregulated and is using toxic chemicals. And to be honest, it's needless to say that we are pleased to hear that consumers increasingly want to receive assurance that the products they buy are made with respect for people respect for the environment and with respect for animals. Animal welfare is of key importance for consumers and it should be of key importance for us as well. I think the leather industry is realizing all this and the responsible leather manufacturers commit to audited standards and working with initiatives such as the ZDHC in order to develop better products. For leather manufacturers, there are four major initiatives that support brands in responsible sourcing of leather. I'm 100% sure all of you will know the leather working group and the multi-stakeholder group that develops and maintains a protocol, now the new protocol P7, that assesses the environmental compliance and performances capabilities of leather manufacturers. You have a similar initiative in Brazil, which is called the CSCB, and you have a similar initiative in Italy, which is called ICEC, I -C -E -C, and you have the Ecotex Ladder Standard, which is also a similar initiative, which is supporting brands to source responsible ladder. The other uh, initiative I already called is called the ZDSC, which was set up to manage chemical inputs and focus on zero discharge of hazardous chemicals. And the ZDAC wants to ensure safer products, cleaner water, and fresher air. And the initiative is focusing on leather and other materials and maintains a manufacturing restricting substance list and wastewater guidelines. And chemical companies can have their product tested uh, to ensure that uh, they are in conformers to the MRSL in the different conformers levels. So what I would like to say with this slide and what we are normally telling to the brands in events where Leather Naturally is invited to speak, we tell these brands, it's not difficult to source leather from a responsible leather manufacturer because there are several certification schemes in place that support this. And I think already that the Indian leather industry is showing that it understands the value with so many tanneries already audited as per the LWG protocol. <laughs> But again, the future of leather, it's in your hands. It's in my hands, it's in your hands. But okay, I'm talking to you now, so I would like to focus on you. But to be honest, I do not believe that I hear, I hear an echo somewhere. But to be honest, I do not believe that every, everyone is realizing uh, that the future of leather is in your hands. And... Um, as I was introduced also, I've been in this industry uh, since 1992. 
And regretfully, I still see today that many people working in this industry, including in India, do not realize what improvement starts, that improvement starts with your own behavior. I still see people also in India working for chemical companies who do not realize that they need to show example by wearing, for example, safety goggles or covered clothing when they work with chemicals in their labs or in a tannery. I still see people with chemical samples that are stored and transported in empty water or Coca-Cola bottles without any labeling, without any SDS. And I wonder, I sincerely wonder if we, if you realize the importance of showing example and if we, you, realize that these examples, these are the examples that end up in the press, which is negatively highlighting letter. If I would be a consumer, or if I would be a critical NGO, and I would see that letter is still being made under these circumstances and that we are not showing example, I would also create a negative image about letter. And I've also seen many tanneries in my life, and still I am surprised to see tanneries where people do not use the walking paths that are clearly marked yellow and with the yellow lines in the tannery. And I still do not understand why is it still possible that flip-flops are still allowed in the tannery? Do we, I really think, do, do we realize the danger to allow flip-flops to be used in a tannery where chemicals are used, where forklifts are driving, and where machines are operating in a wet and often slippery working environment? And in my opinion, this is an attitude topic, and it's an attitude problem. Brands and consumers do no longer want to use materials that are not made under the right conditions. And that's really something we should all keep in mind. So we can invest millions of dollars in education and promotion of leather, but in the end, it is crucial that we, you, do no longer give any reason for discrediting, discrediting our industry or discrediting leather. So stop, stopping discrediting our industry can start today with all of us in the seminar showing example any, every minute of the day. And I would like to conclude my presentation here. Ladder is under attack, but it's not too late. We can still turn this development. Ladder is starting from the byproduct of the food industry, and it's a responsible ladder industry with audited production schemes using the right chemicals has every opportunity in the future. And I'm sure that consumers and society will not fall into the trap to use plastics instead of a natural byproduct. Consumers are not stupid. Leather is beautiful. Leather is luxury. It can be repaired. It can be recycled. And it's the perfect material in a circular economy. You and I, you and I, we, we have the key in our hands by showing example every day that leather is made responsibly as it should be and how it is expected from society. I sincerely look forward to welcome you as a Leather Naturally member and Mecha donator and collaboratively work together and invest in education and promotion of leather. This is crucial for the future of our industry and it's crucial for the future of your company and it's crucial for the future of a responsible society. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Dickers, uh, for your presentation. Come back to you during our question and answer session. Please stay with us. And uh, just a thought that uh, you said that some of the brands are stating that they will not be using leather. How do we counter this? Okay, let's uh, come back to that later on. And now we invite our second speaker. Dr. Uttar Hendrickson. Uh, Dr. Uttar, Uttar Hendrickson is the manager of research and development and geologist, geologist at NERA. Dr. Uttar Hendrickson has been working in the leather and chemical industry at Smith & Zoom and NERA since 2015. After a MSc in chemical engineering and a PhD in materials engineering, he started at Smith & Zoom in R&D of weight and specialty chemicals and has been involved with various projects 
relating to new innovations on low emissions. Recycling of waste streams and tanning. Bhutan has been one of the founders for the zoology tanning technology. In his current role at NEDA, Bhutan is creating a socially and environmentally sustainable leather value chain by introducing geology into the market. He has contributed to several scientific articles and a patent in the field of natural science, material sciences, engineering, and leather processing. This topic for today is leather biodegradability. Dr. Uh, Hendrickson, please. Thank you uh, for your kind introduction. Are you seeing my screen now? Yes, we can see. Okay, great. Um, well, thanks again for the uh, kind introduction. Um, and Nira, it's uh, where I'm working these days, is a daughter company of Smith & Zone, uh, similar to the company uh, where Edward Dickers is working and uh, hopefully well known to you. Uh, also, Kojeko is our uh, sister company uh, these days, so also more widely known. Uh, throughout the world. Today I'll be talking about leather biodegradability and uh, I come from a uh, uh, well, zoology uh, background and uh, a lot of the information that I'll be uh, talking to you uh, today, you can also find back on the um, University of uh, Geology. So this is a website where we gather uh, information around uh, the use of uh, zeolite-based tanning agents, but also a lot of data on leather, which we gather during uh, the whole process. So if you feel more interest, and if you want to read more in the background, please uh, go to this website uh, and uh, read more about it. So what are the key messages for today? Well, biodegradability is a very general term and if you want to consider biodegradability, you have to consider it at all stages of the chain of production and during the life cycle of leather. Biodegradability is also about the testing of the substrate, the substances and materials. It's not just a single uh, topic, there are multiple levels that you need to take care of. And when uh, it actually occurs, it passes through three different stages. So the deterioration, the disintegration, and eventually assimilation. Moreover, um, biodegradability depends on the end of life scenarios and time. It really depends on where does uh, leather, or in that man, uh, sense, any material end up at its end of life. And unfortunately, to make uh, the discussion with especially brands and customers, um, more important, but also uh, not simpler, there's not one universal biodegradability testing method. So when we look at the letter value chain, um, it's our purpose and task. It's just been explained uh, by Edward Dickers to really reposition it uh, due to the different uh, consumer and socioeconomic trends. We have to show and we have to explain what the value of leather is. We, as leather technologists and scientists, we know what the value of leather is, but unfortunately more and more people are losing this feeling and this understanding of how beautiful leather as material is. Well, the Rent Nera and Geology tanning platform is just, not just a new tanning product, but it's a new concept with impact along the value chain. That's why it nicely links to the topic of biodegradability, because we have to think of all the side steps, all the waste streams that we produce during leather making, and they all need to be biodegradable and eventually circular to create a full uh, circular economy. And therefore, uh, creating and exploiting biodegradability of the material which originates with the height that also at all stages in the chain, that will differentiate leather as the ultimate circular material. So when we look at the leather production chain, we of course start off with the heights. So there we have uh, side streams, uh, the trimmings, the shavings, the cuttings. When we then transfer it into leather, 
we have another uh, way stream. So we have cuttings and shavings again, but eventually as well on, on the shoe, on the articles. But the end of life of the consumer article also needs to be taken into account. So when you're thinking of how can I make a biodegradable ladder, first start to think, okay, where in the chain do I find it most important? Maybe your company focuses more on tanning just hides and making leather. And it's important to think about, okay, what happens to my waste streams? Can I make those more biodegradable? Or maybe your company focuses on making lead articles. Then the end of life scenario might be the most important aspect. So biodegradability is just another step in the discussion on sustainability, but then focusing at the end of life. Sustainability in the last decades has been focusing more and more on the general environmental impact. Starts off, okay, with what is the base material that you use? Are you uh, using uh, petroleum-based materials, such as plastics, or are you using bio-based materials? But now, when we start to see, we also have to think of, okay, what happens at the end of life? Especially the plastics industry has been a critical uh, under fire in the last uh, decades, because all, all of the plastics that end up in the oceans, we have to think of what happens to our materials, where do they end up? Leather, for example, ends up a lot in the landfill. So what, does the, what is the impact of leather in a landfill? How can we control that? And therefore, it's also a material property. We have to think of it's not just leather, which is in an article, but all sorts of other materials around it, and how do they interact with each other? It also means that uh, testing such uh, uh, materials is directly a complex matter because it's not from a single uh, molecule, it's from a complex material combining all sorts of different chemistries. And uh, that's what you also see is that the terminology gets quite quickly quite complex due to all the different types of testings, different industries that are working on. Most importantly, if you want to do some testing, you're depending on nature, because biodegradability is depending on how nature functions. So that's one of the disadvantages. It takes some time to actually get your answers and get the data. Therefore, it's important that we share our data and that together we create a better understanding of the impact. That's also one of the reasons why I'm uh, giving this presentation here, so that we create a common understanding and that we speed up this transition. Well, biodegradability. So as I mentioned, there are three areas of testing. You start off with the substrates. So that is the material uh, with which uh, your basis is started. And in the ladder, that's clearly a height. But in non ladder materials, that can be anything from cottons, from plastics, to non wovens to wovens. Then you have the substances and the chemicals which actually make the material. So in the case of leather, we do the tanning, we do the wet end, the crusting, and eventually the finishing. So you have to focus on, okay, these substances, can they be biodegradable on their own, so individually tested, or at least not hinder biodegradability of the overall material? And of course, at the end, it's the material, the leather that needs to be tested because that's what ends up uh, in any end of life scenario. Important here is that uh, tanning uh, leather is actually creating a resistance to biodegradation because the natural heights of the run, they are biodegradable. There's nothing more biodegradable as a substrate than a height. So what we do with tanning is actually creating a resistance to the biodegradation of the initially perfect biodegradable collagen. So what happens during this biodegradation? Well, there are basically three important stages that go on. The first stage is the biodeterioration. So that's where the surface breaks down of the material, so it becomes smaller pieces. From there, uh, the disintegration occurs, and then the smaller pieces um, are even further broken down due to, due to material interaction. 
they go into almost molecular uh, small pieces. Then at the end, uh, third stage, these pieces can actually be taken up into the natural cycle. For example, think of a banana. If it's on your fruit sill and uh, you're, look, you're leaving it a little bit too long, then what you'll see is that the surface breaks down, you get these black spots. And if you leave it even longer, uh, in the end, the banana becomes soft, becomes all small, so small pieces, and the bacteria are really uh, enjoying it. Then in the end, actually, if you put it into the ground, plants will start growing on it. And over time, the uh, banana will be fully taken up. Interestingly enough, uh, bananas are actually not that quick to be broken down. They need quite some help. Uh, and other types of materials are a lot faster. But it's a good uh, material to have in your compost. And it's a good material to let plants grow on. So uh, the testing for the end of life environment. Any uh, letter can be found in any type of end of life environment, such as landfills, effluent treatment plants, or it can be littered in nature. And the biodegradability is the action of microorganisms. And microorganisms are strongly influenced by the environment. So how much moisture is there? What is the temperature? What kind of other components are there around? So what we've tried to envision here is an overview of the type of end of life scenarios that you can encounter. So is there a lot of oxygen available or not? Is the temperature cool or is it warm? And uh, is it aqueous or is it a more dry environment? So in this overview, we've plotted several different kinds of end of life scenarios uh, and also related to the different type of testings that can be done. Most of these testings actually originate from the plastics industry and are adapted uh, for leather types of materials. So here it's an uh, ISO 20200 testing method that's an industrial composting uh, uh, test. It can also be done on a, on a more uh, standard uh, temperature conditions for home composting. Another important uh, type of testing is uh, for effluent treatment plants uh, under aqueous conditions, or for example, for more landfill conditions, the HDM D5511. There are lots of more of other type of uh, testing uh, methods uh, that can be selected depend of the end of life scenarios or on other specific uh, conditions. So when you're comparing biodegradability, it's also important to realize what kind of end of life scenario am I looking at? What kind of testing method is actually used? Because a material can very well degrade under industrial composting uh, conditions, but under dry uh, anaerobic conditions, it might be actually very slow. So then making the comparisons of the amount of material left over after a certain amount of time can be very confusing. So one of the things that you'll hear a lot in the discussion on biodegradability is actually compostability. So what's then the difference? Well, compostability is just one specific case of biodegradation. It's a uh, biodegradation process on the very specific uh, controlled conditions. And typically it's the industrial way of click, quickly uh, producing compost. And compost actually focuses on the two first stages. So the biodeterioration and the disintegration. And there are two types of tests, tests that can easily be used. The ISO 20,200, the 14,855. Um, but these tests mainly focus on the first two stages. If you want to know what happens to a material that's actually biodegraded, you also need to look at, okay, is it actually being taken up? So is it bioassimilated at the end? For that, uh, you can look at a plant regrowth, a plant response test, as well as the ecotoxicity. Because if there are components in your ladder that are actually toxic uh, at the end of life, 
then they will remain. And if you put that in a compost in the end of the run, the plants will not grow on it, or over time, the toxicity of the ground will actually increase. And this is where it's important to realize that the toxicity of the substances that you use to make leather are important because they end up in the ground. So if you would make compost out of leather and then put it in the ground to grow your crops on, at one point, certain compounds will go back uh, into the feedstocks and they may end up on your own plate. So what we've done, uh, we've tested a couple of materials um, for the composting and uh, the typical conditions that you use uh, is a, a standard compost. There's air and there's moisture in there. Uh, the industrial level in 58 degrees gives the quickest uh, time. So then you use a, a maximum time of either ID or 90 or 110 days. And this one is specifically adapted for uh, leather, although it's originated from plastic materials. Um, the criteria when you can say that a uh, uh, piece of leather is fully composted is that uh, at least 90% or yeah, 90% of the material is actually uh, smaller than two millimeters uh, after 90 days of testing. But it can also be quicker. Here on the right, you see that uh, very well composted uh, leather gives you very nice, fine uh, material, which will be fully part of the uh, compost. But if it's not so well uh, composted, so badly composted, it actually stays in very large pieces. And if you take the compost made of the first material, you let the plants grow on it. This is a sort of positive response that you can get. So these are tomato plants. And the test actually counts what are the heights that the plants get, the amount of leaves and their color intensities as a measure of their um, livelihood. On top of that, uh, you can do ecotoxicity testing and then the compost, so the ground is actually tested for which kind of components are still in there that might be possibly toxic. Another kind of testing, uh, the ISO 20136, uh, that's more related to the effluent treatment plants because here you work on aqueous conditions, 25 degrees. You use a leather powder and uh, sludge and some nutrients, and you actually measure the amount of CO2 as a measure of uh, chemical breakdown or um, yeah, breakdown. Um, and here it's uh, compared to uh, pure collagen. So that's the control. That must be uh, at least biodegraded more than 70% during the test. And then leather can either match the biodegradation of the uh, collagen or be lower. And here we made a comparison uh, of uh, pure collagen, which you see here biodegrades in time. And these are hours. Uh, compared to three different types of tendages, which are in the industry. Um, and where you see very large differences in uh, the overall biodegradation, as well in the, as in the type of behavior. For example, this green one starts to biodegrade almost from the first start, but just slower compared to the uh, naked collagen. This red one actually starts to have a small biodegradation in the beginning, but then completely levels off. And the blue one um, here shows a very, very, very slow biodegradation. And at one point, it's actually start to increase more and more. We also see very different behavior between different kinds of tanning agents. And here the, the reference uh, is, the, is the pure collagen, uh, which would be the case if you, not, if you would not treat leather. So then how to make compostable leather? Because that's probably the question that we all get from our customers. How do we then do that? So how do we deal with the synthetic chemicals and retaining and finishing? And how do you balance between biodegradability and the durability or the lifetime of a leather product? 
So these are relevant questions there. Hello. So I have a couple of advices that I can give you. So first of all, talk to your own customers. Letter articles need to be designed with the end of life in mind. So if they think biodegradability is important, and which aspects do they find less important? Um, one misunderstanding that a biodegradable material does not necessarily mean that it has a short lifespan. Some biodegradable materials actually do have a very long lifespan, but under certain conditions, you, they can still be composted quickly. Um, the used substances, so the tanning agents, other chemicals, need to give the least resistance to biodegradation, but more importantly, they need, uh, need to be more toxic. Uh, at this moment, we're doing additional research on the, the impact of the different wet end chemistries uh, used by uh, Smith & Zone. Uh, so hopefully in the second half of this year, we'll be able to give you a new update in that. So also visit those, our website to get more information there. So how to make biodegradable letters or articles uh, start off with the end of life by designing it. Try to define the testing method for the relevant customer or brand. So what do they find biodegradable? Which testing method should be used? And select natural or natural-like chemistries because they tend to be more likely to be biodegradable. Don't use harmful or possibly toxic chemistries. Although they might be quite okay during use, think of what, do they, what would happen with them at their end of life. Also, don't use excess amount of chemicals. Be sure not to use too much uh, because in the end, this will limit the biodegradation by microorganisms. And that's the last part. Think, of, think as a microorganism. So the more protective you make the letter, for example, with a very thick finishing coating, the more difficult it will be for a microorganism to actually reach the collagen fibers and actually start to biodegrade. So what I've tried to tell you today is uh, biodegradability needs to be considered at the all stages in the production chain and during the life cycle. It's testing of substrate, substances, and materials, and it passes through three different stages, the biodeterioration, bio disintegration, and assimilation. Biodegradability depends on the end of life scenario. So is it wet, is it dry? Is there a lot of uh, oxygen or not? And there's not one universal biodegradability testing method or claim. So always go into the discussion what a brand or a customer means when they say, I'd like to have biodegradable leather. And with that, uh, I want to point out to you our University of Geology on the Near Egg Tanning website, uh, where we recently uploaded the masterclass also on this topic and have uh, more data available for you. Thank you very much. Thank you for an informative presentation. I will also come back to you during the question answer session. And uh, now we invite Dr. Pradeep Chattavadai, former principal of Government in College of Engineering and Leather Technology and Insecurity Institute of Engineering to moderate the session and handle the question answer session. Well, uh... Thank you, Subir. Uh, the President, uh, ILTA, General Secretary, uh, Ratan Choudhury, and uh, our honorable speakers, Dr. Uttar Hendrickson and Mr. Egbert Dickers. I have been entrusted with the responsibility to moderate uh, the speakers' uh, speeches, valuable speeches. <clears throat> But before that, I, I, I say something in a few key, key words, a punchline. These two topics that was uh, discussed was very important in the sense the sustainable development and the circular economy and also the biodegradability of the leather. Now, 
in my uh, terms, uh, the holistic view of the sustainable development means that uh, we must ensure that we leave the same quality and quantity of natural resources that we have been using in our generation and must be able to hand over the same quality and same quantity of raw materials to our next generation to thrive on. Failing which the aim of sustainability is going to be lost. And in that case, I will call, recall the uh, famous German philosopher E.F. Schumacher, who has been emphasizing, and this has been used by both the speakers today, that restrict the consumption, be judicious in consumption. Now here again, we can find a sort of a contrasting situation because our economical growth, main importance of the economical growth of any country relies on increasing consumption. And here now we are talking about decreasing consumption or optimizing com consumption. Well, we have to find a middle line, a borderline between these two, how to balance these two factors, obviously. Now coming straight away to uh, Mr. Dickers, who spoke about circular economy. He has warned us that there is a heavy attack of, uh, you know, the companies using non-leather materials in a globally worldwide. And we all are aware of it, definitely, we are having a huge competition from non-leather segments. The NGOs and uh, different organizations, uh, the manufacturers also uh, mix uh, a image of leather as a kind of a villain. By using certain myth, certain self-proclaimed, uh, uh, you know, uh, these things which are, most of them are not correct. Scientifically, they could not establish anything, but some of them are of course the fact where we should focus. And also it is important for the global lobby to come forward and to strongly resist this kind of, uh, you know, the image making process, which will create a great problem, a barrier to the leather industries in future to survive. Because we never know how the consumers are keeping what image of our product, unless they spell out and we cannot go and read their minds. Some of them are completely nonsense and, and some of them are resulting due to our own negligence. And that is the most important thing. And in that regard, the education, and promotion of these things are uh, promotion of the knowledge on the leather is a important factor. And we are happy to know that metra.com and leathernaturally.org is also working uh, jointly in, in, this, in this regard. The problem lies in various arena in a nutshell how to utilize the, and incorporate the waste material. Leather has several advantages itself by its origin as compared to its main competitor, the plastics, polymers, that it utilizes uh, the, uh, the main uh, waste material of the society, that is raw hides and skins, which otherwise would have been wasted. It lasts long and can be repaired and recycled. It's a versatile of a product, kind of a product, and it is responsibly made. It's transparent and accountability of the leather makers can be justified by several certification, globally accepted certification authorities. Leather perhaps is the oldest, 5,000 years oldest example of recycling of material. 
the meat that goes around against the leather is that the billions of animals are killed to make leather. At least 60% of the young people in the West believes this is true. But the fact remains that the leather comes out of the meat industry. 7.3 million tons of hides are produced each year. And we have the responsibility to turn the waste into a versatile product and that the industry has been doing. Only that is required is to make a projection of the image very strongly to the community segment. Now I can read, uh, I, I have been working in an in a, uh, ecotoxicology field and also the environmental field. And I can remember that suppose if we do not produce a leather and if we leave, leave these raw hides and skins to be biodegradable automatically in the environment, the ecotoxical it, 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 the ecotoxicological impact on the uh, hydrogen skins lead to perish would have been more, the carbon footprint would have been more than when it is used or converted into leather. So therefore, this myth has to be established. The carbon footprint of the hydrogen skins left to the environment for degradation would have been more as compared to the carbon footprint of manufacturing leather from that hides and skins. So it is not only the environment that is in question, but also it is, in, it is the question of economy and employment generation that is also a outcome, a offshoot of this problem. There are of course several methods of recycling and conversion of solid waste that is generated due to this process. And we all are trying, we all are trying to move our production line in such a way that we can go ultimately reach to a zero waste. Vegan leather. Vegan leather is another one where it is given an impression to the mind of the consumer that it is a, a non is, is a vegan, it's not uh, killing the animal. They are trying to capitalize the sentiment of the consumer. Whereas, whether it is a vegan leather or it is a pure leather or a leatherette or fast or whatever, they use the term leather. So using the term leather as a prefix or a suffix of a noun itself justifies the superiority of the leather. Otherwise, they could use as simply as vegan, not vegan leather or leatherette. Why the question of leather is coming? Because that itself in the back of their mind makes a sense that leather is superior material to them. But that creates a confusion amongst the amongst the consumers. Because if they can capture a larger share of the cake, then soon enough, we will be out of the market. Now, it has to be seen also that the leaders are made with less toxic or the non-toxic chemicals. And there are several certification units like uh, LWG, Roadmap Zero, ICEC, CS, C, CSCB, or Oikotex, et cetera, who certifies these things. And a responsible manufacturer of leather, whether in India or third world country or in the Western country has to go for, needs to go for certification in order to earn the confidence of the consumer. And that is very important. It's a question of attitudinal problem. And very rightly, Mr. Taker has uh, pointed out 
that it is shocking to see the people are handling the chemicals or the process in the tannery in the wet shop without the safety gadgets and even with the flip flop well uh this is something which is a which is a which is a fault i must admit of the management to look into these things very seriously because if this continues then definitely it reflects that we are less responsible we care less that is very dangerous trend now coming to dr utter hendrickson who has spoken on biodegradability of the leather or in a nutshell within quote and unquote i would say the cradle to grave approach the here also leads a kind of a dichotomy why you know the neanderthal men used to raw hides and skins as a footwear as a tent as a clothing material and that used to go for biodegradation purification and in order to prevent the purification the tanning system was discovered by accident in order to preserve it now the dichotomy lies that we have to now go back to see how we can make the tanned leather biodegradable is a reverse part of development now biodegradability as is stated is a is a chain of operations it's not only connected with the lifetime of the material the biodegradability relies on three factors bio deterioration bio disintegration and then assimilation bio assimilation but the problem lies that there is lies no universal biodegradable testing methods and it is time consuming 90 days to 180 days the testing time is also time consuming as i have said the substrate that is the hides and skins are already biodegradable there is no doubt of it as compared to plastics then we are adding substances that is the chemicals and these chemicals interacting chemically with the substrate or the hides or the fibers or the collagen to make the material leather now the leather therefore would contain either the chemicals or the derivative of the chemicals after the reaction and therefore when you go for ultimate look for ultimate biodegradability we must also see into it that the chemicals that we are using are of less toxicity more toxic chemicals are to be replaced by a less toxic chemicals either the chemicals itself are less toxic or the derivative that they produce with the interaction with the collagen that is less toxic otherwise they remains inside the leather and they can hamper the biodegradability biodegradation is a steady process of uh, breakdown and the testing methods are broadly classified into three directions that is anaerobic or it is aerobic in aqueous conditions or it is aerobic in a dry conditions and in that case the biodegradation and bio disintegration leads to the fact of bio compostability here we are talking about bio compostability bio compostability should ultimately aim to produce a bio assimilation and a plant growth and when the plant grows we have to go for eco evolution of the ecotoxicity to see the effect of ecotoxic toxic toxicity on the plant less toxic chemicals are to be used we have to go for what you call very favor uh, my my favorite uh, you know terminology is uh, atomic economy 
avoid using excess chemicals, the chemicals that are not required, the amount or the kind of a chemicals that are not required, the chemicals that do not form a part of the leather, that has to be uh, discarded. And he has also emphasized that the thickness of the film, finished film on the leather surface should be as small as possible, as thin as possible, because the first step of biodegradation is the attacking and the cracking, disintegration of the surface. And if the finished film is thick, the surface degradation takes place a longer time. And the thin, as thin as it is, it is going to be more and more easy for the microorganisms to grow and to act on it and to process. It's something like a, you know, this uh, uh, fault, making a fault in the crystal structure. Once you make a fault and then the fault is propagated uh, in a larger scale for orienting for a larger scale of degradation. And there uh, it goes without saying that formally we know all of all of us know that the glaze uh, finish has a least uh, thickness followed by you know resin finish and uh, uh, you know small resin finish and the highest possibly thin thickness is the uh, patent finishing so the film thickness uh, within micrometer range uh, should be as small as possible and most possibly, as far as I can remember, 20 to 25 micrometer film thickness is good enough for this kind of thing. And uh, that's all from my side. Now I would uh, go back to Subir uh, to uh, start the question answer session. Subir, please. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Budhir Chattopadhyay. Uh, we request you. Uh, 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 if you can handle the question answer session also, sir. Okay, fine. Um, now I would request uh, uh, the whoever want to raise a question, please raise your hand. You can go back to the to the to the down and see the participants there. Click on the participants. You will find a, a raising hands icon. Click on the hands, and we are going to know who are you, and we are going to ask you the questions. You can unmute yourself and ask the questions then. Yeah, till someone double clicks it, I just want to make a comment that uh, I think Mr. Manikam he has made two uh, two statements in the chat. Uh, but the this is to the uh, total panel that uh, circular economy and biodegradability move in opposite directions. Uh, if anyone can throw light on uh, Ms. Cleary's confusions, and also the second question he asked is, please let me know why any sustainable system does not obey the tanning definition. Yeah, whether uh, Mr. Levity on the panel, uh, whether they can clear this doubt of Mr. Manikam to Mr. Egbert Dickers or Dr. Uttar Hendrickson or Dr. Buddhadev Chattopadhyay. Yeah, Walter, Walter, shall I take one part? Yes, yes sir. Yeah. Um, I see the question about circular circularity and biodegradability. Um, I think the nice thing about uh, uh, leather is, and that is also a, a big principle of um, uh, circularity, eh? words like repair, reuse, refurbish, uh, repurpose. And I gave some examples in my presentation um, eh, of uh, leather that is then later on repurposed instead of a shoe, it is made into something else. But in the end, in the end, a product you can recycle and you can repurpose it, but in the end, it might be necessary that a product needs to be given back um, um, uh, to, to the ground level. Huh? It needs to be back, uh, given back to the earth huh? where it is originating from. And that's why biodegradability is coming in there. So um, 
I don't see it for myself that it is going into opposite direction. I think uh, it is very much in line with each other and you need both um, 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 for, the for the future of our industry, but also for the future of society. I'm not sure, Wouter, if you would like to add something there. No additions, very clear. I would also like to comment on um, on the introduction that was um, made uh, by Mr. Uh, Badudep. Um, I think it is very good what you were saying also, that uh, I heard you saying that uh, there is a new uh, thing going and it might be that um, uh, with longevity, um, that ladder will take longer and that the economy is focusing on consumption, consumption, consumption. I think it's a challenge for all of us. I think when the consumption of initially of new products would go down, a brand new type of economy could start up eh, with people who are repairing things, which can create many, many jobs. And in the past, at least here in the Netherlands and in Europe, many of these jobs, they have been gone. Eh, because now it is that you buy a shoe, you buy a leather shoe, with a plastic sole or rubber sole, the rubber sole is uh, finished and then you throw away the shoe because the shoemaker cannot do anything with it. And I think that is where circularity is coming in. That is changing the design from the beginning, changing the design from the beginning that um, you always look at the weakest material. And uh, again, also look into uh, developing a new kind of uh, uh, economies. And I would like to come back to one other, other point. I think you were very clear and very right about that it's important that there is an international, a global lobby to help that people speak about leather. But to have such a lobby, you need to have money. You need to have money for people who are talking on behalf of the leather industry. You need to have a lobby for people who have the opportunity to create educational materials and this is exactly the reason why, for instance, also an institute or an association like Leather Naturally was set up. And this is exactly what Leather Naturally is also doing. Lobbying is creating a, a different image with brands, but this needs money. And I think what is important to realize, and I really, I would like to, uh, to make an appeal to all of you. I think it's very important to realize that an image, an image of an industry of an image of the product that you produce does not come for free. You need to invest in an image. And because of the reason that the leather industry for many years did hardly or did not invest in education, did hardly invest in uh, promoting uh, leather, that is one of the reasons for the, for the shitty situation that we are in today. So that's again an appeal to you, to each one of you, talk within your companies how you can support initiative, initiatives like uh, Leather Naturally, but Leather Naturally is not the only one, but how you can support initiatives like that, that can help you to build on the future of your industry, because otherwise there is no future. Very Thank true, you. Very, very true, very true. And uh, Mr. Jaya, Mr. Jaya Singh has raised his hand. Uh, can I ask uh, her to unmute and please ask the question? Mr. Jaya Singh? Jaya Singh? Probably he's going out. Okay. And as far as I am concerned, I cannot see the, uh, I cannot see anybody raising hands. Okay, Sudarshan Misra, Sudarshan Misra, please. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, can you please ask the questions? You have raised your hand. Okay, sir. My question goes to Dr. Walker. Dr. Walter has already said uh, not one test method uh, is there for the general biodegradability. May I request him to throw some more light on this subject? Are experts on the same page with regard to defining general biodegradability 
or biodegradability specific to leather. The scenario is a bit vague as some buyers have started to demand biodegradable leathers from the suppliers. Definitely a distinct line of demarcation has to be drawn between durability and biodegradability specific to leather. Dr. Wouter. Thank you very much for your question. Um, for that, uh, let's first have a look on how in the other industries handle this topic. Um, so if you look at the plastics industry, they've already been working for about 20 years on biodegradability and bio-based materials. And that's where most of the discussion started off with. What they originally uh, claimed was biodegradable plastics. Unfortunately, they're now finding out that the term biodegradable is such a broad term uh, that they get opposite claims because a biodegradable plastic in some cases is actually not biodegradable because they tested it for a uh, dry uh, composting uh, test, but that it ends up in the ocean and in the ocean then it's not that quickly biodegradable. So if a customer is asking you, I want to have biodegradable material, ask them, okay, what kind of biodegradability are you looking for? What you now see is that most uh, industries actually focus on composting. Composting is a industrial uh, method for creating compost or better said biodegradable, uh, biodegraded uh, materials, which then can easily be reused into uh, groundworks for agriculture. And that's nicely closing loop. My advice would be focus on composting if you want to sell a biodegradable material. It's a relatively well-defined test and it's good to use. But on the other side, if you're having your own tannery and you're doing your own tanning, then focusing on a uh, effluent treatment plant and the biodegradability might, even, might be even more worthwhile. But this really also depends on your, or your own choices where you want to lay your own focus on, but realize that one is not per se the other. And in relation to your uh, remark on durability and biodegradability, um, I think we all know where letters started off with. So um, it's, I mean, already from Neanderthalers or Egyptians, they work with all sorts of materials. Most of these materials were gone, but never, nevertheless, they were also very durable. It's only in the last 100, 200 years that we've started making letters, which are that durable, that they're hardly biodegradable anymore. So we have to reconsider how important is durability to us? Is it the most important factor or are we even overextending it a bit too much? In some cases, it might be st still be very worthwhile. <laughs> if you want to make a briefcase which lasts more than uh, 20 years, use your known technologies. In other cases, it might be more applicable to use new type of chemistries uh, that allow you to create more biodegradable leather within the durability lifetime that is expected. So think of where does your leather end up and try to use the proper uh, chemistries for that. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. I, I, I have one question. Uh, this is a purely uh, I, may I ask one question? Just one okay. minute, one minute. We have a question in the chat session. Let us give the preference first. Okay. Mr. V. Ganeshan has asked, Mr. Uter, uh, Dr. Uter, you have to, can you please explain to him, what is the advantage of vegan leather over the leather for regular and continuous use? So what is the advantage of vegan Ve leather? Vegan leather, yeah, right. Over the leather, so far as the regular well, use is concerned. Actually, uh, uh, it's a very nice question. Um, recently, the uh, Freiburg Institute uh, in Germany made a very nice research. So they've compared I think around 10 to 15 different types of materials 
at all claim to be an alternative to leather. And what you see is that each type of material has its own specific added value. So some materials are very um, tensile strength, other materials are very flexible, but none of these materials had all the properties similar to leather. So what you see there is that leather in the general term is um, high scoring on all material properties. When I explain this to my wife or to my friends, the thing what I always say is that in the end, leather is your own skin. Nothing feels as good as your own skin and nothing lasts as long as your own skin. We can do beautiful things uh, with chemistry. I mean, I'm from a background, I'm a chemist. We can do beautiful things with it, but nothing matches nature. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uter. Now, here's a question from uh, Galaxy M01. Probably this is the, you know, the mobile uh, phone uh, brand, but uh, initial I can see GM. Can you please uh, uh, ask the question? Unmute yourself, Mr. GM. You have raised a hand. One hand has been raised. Mr. GM. Can you please unmute yourself and ask the questions? Okay. And then uh, I would ask uh, uh, Mr. Ratan uh, Choudhury to ask the question. Uh, okay, good evening. I'm Ratan Choudhury. Uh, I have a question. Uh, rather, I will, uh, because uh, you are two global people, we are getting it to the evening. So my uh, question to both of you, because the greener technology or biodegradable technology is, is easily, okay, easily to tell, but when you can really do it in practice, it enhances certain costing and commercial part when it costs, look into this, the cost factor is there. Now, when you are in the in factory, tannery, I have my experience because I was associated up with Shil and Shilakar 25 years and with Bangladesh and uh, uh, North Indian market. I have seen when we go for greener technology or biodegradable technology, the leather is beautiful and acceptable to the buyer is very much. But when they go for the pricing, they're asking the price, which is not justified to accept the bio biodegradable or greener technology. How the global people or global chemical or the organization like you, they, how you people are helping the industry. I, I'm not talking about the only leather industry in India, that to influence the people that there is a two type of thing. One is the, this greener technology where they will get a better life and better pollution, environmental friendly, and where we can get a better price also. You have to pay a little bit more because dumping cost of Germany in Dusseldorf and Stuttgart is much more, much different. So they can get a better, less dumping cost and share that dumping cost to the third world country. How this, your organization will help us uh, to this uh, big, big, big player like a shoe company or leather buyer. So I'm asking both of them, both of you. Okay. Yep. Auto, do you want to start? Um, yeah. So if I understand the question uh, correctly, uh, if we want to go to greener technologies, uh, there comes a price with it. Mm. And I not think that's true. Not discounted price. Is there, is there, is, I'm not asking the discounted price. I'm asking that we will follow that green and technology, how the buyer will accept that price, which is justified to make a greener technology later. Yeah, yeah. So how do we transfer the message to brands, yes. to uh, shoe producers, to uh, well any other type of uh, material users that we're not just making leather, no, we're actually making greener leather. Yeah. That's indeed also one of the reasons why, for example, leather naturally is so important. And also why we as uh, NERA 
but also translating this image and translating this message. So it's the challenge for all of us in the industry that we defer ourselves from plastic-based materials because that's where the critical aspect is. That's where we win. We win with showing uh, the impact of how leather can be made and what the impact is of leather on the long run. So what we do as a NERA, we actually have quite a lot of contacts, not just with tanneries or with chemical buyers. No, we actually have a lot of contacts also with brands and with the end consumers to really inform them, okay, what's the value of using geology? How can we help our own customers with selling their letters? It also means that you uh, as a tannery also have to translate this message. Like uh, Edward Dickers mentioned earlier, that's not only just selling leather. It's showing that you have a good company that you're working with, that you're taking responsibility for your own actions. And if you show that, then you give the value. And that value is then translated also uh, to the brands and eventually also to the end consumers. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I would like to comment on that uh, on that as well. Uh, I think Wouter is totally right. Um, and I think that there are certain things which come in here. I mean, uh, organizations like Leather naturally try to talk to the brands, the same like the Leather Working Group, for instance, is doing, or the same like the ZDAC is doing. Because we can have all kinds of nice programs. And again, eh, also what uh, eh, Wouter is connected to, uh, to Smith & Zone's uh, geology, we invested a lot of money in developing this technology. And that means that we now need to share with the industry why this new development is an added value for you as a tenor and for the brand. And much of this has to do with the total cost of ownership. Because I said, I've, I've been traveling in this industry for many, many years. And I've talked to many tenneries also saying that, okay, if you want to do business with me, yeah, our policy is, is that we pay maximum $1.5 uh, $1 for a kilo of chemical. And then I say, okay, but, but why would you not pay double, for instance, or 10% more when I'm giving you an added value later on that you have less effluent, that you have less waste material. But if you don't look at the total cost of ownership to make a change in the chemicals, for instance, will be very difficult. And I think it's, it's the, 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 uh, the challenge for all of us to support initiatives like the Ladder Working Group because they have a close connection to the brands. And we must push the brands that they should not only be a, a member of the Ladder Naturally, of, uh, of the Ladder Working Group, but they should also source the ladder from the Ladder Working Group audited companies. And there are still too many brands. And I've, I've experienced it myself. I was in Kampur. Uh, one and a half year ago, uh, just before the uh, COVID crisis. And I remember I was uh, sitting at one of our customers and uh, there was a customer also from Eastern Europe. And I asked to him, um, what is important for you when you are buying leather from this tannery? He said, yeah, the price. I said, okay, but there must be other things as well, like sustainability. He says, no, I don't care. It's only the price. But I'm convinced that this kind of customers so this kind of letter buyers who, who buy the letter on these conditions, they are going out of business. And that's the same also as a tannery, as a chemical company. If you don't make the change uh, 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 and stepping up and doing the right things, you're going out of business. That is the main thing. If the brand is not come forward, then uh, it will be very difficult for the Canary investor to make that type of leather. The brand should come forward and tell, oh, I, need, I need this type of leather. Can you offer me this type of leather? Then the, uh, the, the chemical people or the investor, the, that means the tannery people, they can offer. But if the brand is asking, no, 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 I don't want this. I want the price. Then it will be a very difficult. That is my question. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Gudel Chattopadhyay. Uh, yes. We are, we are running short of time. So uh, I think if any questions is left unanswered, I would request them to forward that question to our IELTA office uh, and we'll forward it to the speakers. 
and we'll get back to you with the uh, replies. Uh, so now I would request, uh, as a concluding part, as the customer, I would request our general secretary, Mr. Sushanto Mullik, to offer the vote of thanks. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Dotto. Sorry, it is uh, uh, late. That's why the question answer session has to be cut short. But if there is any question, please forward it to ILTA so that we can forward it to the honorable speakers. First of all, on behalf of our association, we express thanks and gratitude to both the honorable speakers, Dr. Hendrickson and Mr. Dickers, for their extremely useful deliberations on the topics which are most relevant in present scenario. We'll be grateful to both the honorable speakers if you give us your deliberations in a printable format so that we can print these valuable articles in our 70-year-old monthly technical journal, which has a wide circulation throughout the world. We will also need your valuable guidance in formulating a long-term project to promote leather and to erase the wrong impression the common people are carrying in their mind on leather. Here is the importance of, form, of forming a strong lobby and the importance of educating the common people. In fact, we want to uh, work extensively on this uh, burning issue and our seminar committee is seriously working on this subject. Uh, Mr. Dotto will soon coordinate with you for your expert opinion to fine tune our project on this issue. However, our association will remain grateful to you, sir, for your wonderful deliberation today. We are also grateful to Dr. Chattopadhyay for moderating the entire event so nicely. We are thankful to all the participants for their overwhelming participation in the deliberations and question answer session. Thanks to all of you once again and good night.